Hey y'all, Scott here. I'm not Scott the Waz, but I make fun of him for good reasons. One of those reasons being is that we were both born in 1997, which is a year I don't really see that many people being born. I feel like you constantly interact with somebody who was born in 1996 or 1998 or the year 2000. Rarely do you ever see anybody born in an odd year. So I commend Scott the Waz. Anyways, fuck Scott the Waz. This is me time. Today, we're going to be talking about Rareware. And the reason why I bring up the year 1997 in particular is because the Nintendo 64 had actually came out the year before. Now growing up, I was more accustomed to the Nintendo 64 and the Game Boy Advanced SP. Those were just consoles I grew up with. I would play the Nintendo 64 and GameCube at home, and then wherever I went with my mom being held against my will to do some shopping, I would bring my Game Boy. And that's how I was exposed to a game much like Donkey Kong Country, which I had not played except on my Game Boy. I hadn't been exposed to the Super Nintendo version until I was an adult. I missed out on the Super Nintendo unlike many people, which later on I found out was a big fucking mistake. But I'm not here talking about the Super Nintendo, I'm here talking about Rareware. Ah, Rareware. Such a beautiful company known for making such beautiful games from our childhood. Now I should clarify that Rareware had actually changed their branding name to the name Rareware during the Super Nintendo era. Before they were known as Ultimate Play the Game, which is probably the dumbest company name in existence. But what are you gonna do? It was the early 80s. I don't know too much about Rare's beginning years in the late 80s, or early 80s. I know they made WrestleMania, but that's another video. The most significant Rareware game to me, in my opinion, is Banjo-Tooie. Having cemented a childhood full of wonderful imagination and fun for years to come, I found this game simply sublime as I grew up. The cozy catacombs of the endless caverns, the hot and cold universe where you had to fight the two different dragons, the flying part where you had to destroy the air balloon dinosaur, climbing massive heights and having the music stop just to indicate to you how far you are away from the happiness you once had in this happy-go-lucky universe and could potentially face impending doom if you so much as make a mistake. They do this in Conker's Bad Fur Day as well. Rareware is just a perfect company. From a range of really hard games to damn near ridiculous. Rareware was a titan in the early 90s to the early 2000s, and here is 10 years of Rareware games. As I had mentioned before, I was born in 1997, so I had spent a lot of time on Rareware games as they were in their prominence during that era. The first game I had ever played in my life was Diddy Kong Racing for the Nintendo 64. I spent many hours of my life playing Donkey Kong 64 and all three Donkey Kong Country games, which I played on my SP. Now let me go on the record as saying I fucking love Donkey Kong. I always picked him in Mario Kart. When Mario Party 5 on, they started taking him out as a playable character, which I thought was pretty fucking stupid. But it only added to the value and worth of Donkey Kong as a character. Now the reason why I'm not talking about games like GoldenEye, Killer Instinct, and Perfect Dark, and never grew up with them, I don't know anything about it, and, and I don't give a shit about them personally. I'm talking about my childhood, not yours. More recently I delved into two significant games which have inspired this whole thing, and that's the 10 year difference in which Rareware dominated on the Nintendo Entertainment System with one of the hardest NES games ever produced. Battletoads, and their demise with the release of Conker's Bad Fur Day in 2001 on the Nintendo 64, marking the end of a long 10-year run with Nintendo. 1993 saw Rareware go Battletoads crazy. They released so many renditions of Battletoads Double Dragon throughout the year, it's no wonder a lot of people know about Battletoads and are beating the game blindfolded on YouTube. Battletoads launched Rare to the top. When they had games like Jetpack, which I have only rarely played on the Donkey Kong 64 game, it's no wonder why nobody gave a shit about them until they made Battletoads. Battletoads is so fucking hard. I think I've restarted that game more times than I've jerked off. And it just launched them to the top. I mean, not in ways to which Banjo-Kazooie would send them into, you know, millions of dollars later on. But Battletoads definitely set a precedent in Nintendo's eyes. And I feel like when Nintendo saw this, they were like, Just go ahead and take Donkey Kong from us, you crazy fucks. Which, if you go on, like, any kind of website, 
you'll find that Nintendo actually put a large stake into Rare's company because they really believed in this company and they really believed that they were going to make some fabulous games, which they did. They had given them, I believe it was a $250,000 advance, which is the most any game company saw at that point in time. After Battletoad Mania in 1993 ended, 1994 saw the rise of Kurt Cobain's suicide. Now, I cannot stress how closely linked Rareware and Nirvana are. When Rareware dropped Battletoads in 1991, Kurt Cobain dropped Nevermind. When Rareware started working on Donkey Kong Country in 1994, Kurt Cobain shot himself. Not to bring down the mood, but this is some valid information that I feel like nobody else really knows or cares about. But this just gives some, some, uh, this just gives some environmental awareness to what was going on at that time. Did you know that Kurt Cobain would play Super Mario Brothers in his downtime? I thought that was a pretty fucking cool fact. 1994. What an incredible year that was. Rareware had made the leap from 8 bits to 16 bits the same year that Kurt Cobain shot himself. Such a year for history. After Nintendo entrusted Rareware with the Donkey Kong series, that pretty much spent the better part of two, almost three years milking the series name. Rareware was very good in the beginning, pre-Banjo-Kazooie, of milking their titles. They had milked Battletoads and Donkey Kong into the general culture so hard that anybody can know these games just off the top of your head. Which brings me to Diddy Kong Racing, a game that came out the same year I was born, 1997. Which brings me to a set of disappointing criticism. Why play that when you have this? Well, I'll give you one word. Nostalgia. I'm not too big on Diddy Kong Racing anymore because I had played that game to death and it really does just remind me of my early childhood and the feelings of nostalgia are just a tad too overwhelming. Let's do a quick recap. We started in 1991 with Battletoads and they had milked that for the entirety of Kurt Cobain's career as the frontman in Nirvana. Then after Kurt Cobain died, we're now in 1994, they milk Donkey Kong into the ground. Because we never saw Donkey Kong in the 2000s. Because they had him and they abused him. Which I honestly think was a pretty smart move considering they would be bought out many years later. Banjo-Kazooie was a game very prevalent to me in my life, released in 1998, a year after Diddy Kong Racing, this would show the direction that Rare was trying to go into. They had made the switch from 2D games to 3D games, but I think they were just a tad more comfortable playing with 2D games, because that gave them an edge to be innovative. They were primarily smarter in that field, and had spent the better part of almost 20 years perfecting it. Now they're going into completely new territory, which kind of puts them on the same level as everyone else, and I don't think they liked that. But, they did what they did. And that's what brings us to Banjo-Kazooie, which was an original Rareware title that was going to shoot them into the millions in terms of their success. I mean, they were profiting pretty well from controlling Donkey Kong and still had a lot of Battletoads backbone, but Banjo-Kazooie sent them over the top. The game was a critical and commercial success, selling nearly 2 million copies in the United States, just to quote Wikipedia really quick. This game was so popular that for many years before Banjo-Kazooie's Nuts and Bolts, people were begging for Banjo-Kazooie 3. I would prank my sister saying that it actually came out and would Photoshop or whatever the fuck I would do back then, like Windows Movie Maker and like make fake titles. <laughs> to the game just to hype it up. That's how big this game was. So many people were in love with Banjo-Kazooie. It was just such a brilliant game. And it ironically came out during a point when Rareware wasn't even thinking about this game to begin with. They had started a completely different project known as Project Dream, which was going to involve some RPG elements and be a completely different game altogether. Thank God we did not get that, because no offense Rareware, you're not Square Enix, you make Donkey Kong and Battletoads. So they definitely had good instincts when it came to releasing Banjo-Kazooie, and you could just sh see that it was a brilliant idea in terms of gameplay. 
And it's a game like Banjo-Kazooie, which would only limit Rare from releasing a game that they had been working on so many years prior, which was 12 Tales Conquer 64, which I'm so happy to finally get to this point because I just love everything fucking Rareware, but I specifically love Conquer only because he is only playable in one fucking game. It's like, I wish that you were able to play as him more, omitting the Diddy Kong Racing version of Conquer because I just love the handling and gameplay of that Conquer in that game, and would love to see another Conquer game, but that's besides the point. Going back to Banjo Kazooie, Banjo appeared in Diddy Kong Racing, I suppose, as a teaser. Huh, I never knew that. Considering Diddy Kong Racing had came out a year before, I thought it was pretty interesting that they had used that to tease the new characters coming out. I mean, right from the get go, you're immersed in a world that is created by Rareware, and it's just genius. I always loved Banjo's design as a character, as a bear in a backpack. I remember I would grab backpacks and I would want to be Banjo. I would want to go on those adventures, but I, you know, had the awareness that I was a seven-year-old kid and knew nothing about life, so I just kind of stayed in my room and, and imagined it all instead. I was constantly irked that Kazooie never left the backpack in Banjo-Kazooie 1, maybe because I had always preferred Banjo-Tooie for that element, and that was 1998, and 1999 saw the release of Donkey Kong 64. Woof! What a joke millennials think this game is, but I think it's cool. I really do appreciate everything about this game, from its scenery to its characters and challenges. I just spent so much time on this game as a kid. I would reenact scenes with it from my toys, I mean I was that addicted to Rareware as a kid. A lot of people complain about the backtracking that involves in a lot of the stages gameplay because once you get a Kong you have to go back to the other stage and you got to collect the bananas and do it all so it really seemed lazy for a lot of people Rareware's design. Unlike previous Donkey Kong games where you constantly felt like you were progressing this did seem a bit of a step backwards but like I said we were in the infancy of the 3D era so you didn't really know what to do. You just put big boobs on everything and expect people to buy the game. And Rareware, much like Banjo-Kazooie, didn't want to repeat the same formula and wanted to try something different. Big boobs on everything! No, I'm kidding. But in reality, the 2000s. Banjo-Tooie. Woo! What a new world. Playing as Mumbo, Tooie, Banjo. I mean... This is where Banjo got his edge. He was a fucking child before, and now he's an edgy teenager, and Kazooie's out and about, independent in her means. You can play as the Shaman Mumbo and do magic and control fucking statues and fight primitive people cats and go into Mayan temples and get launched in the sky and see fucking dinosaurs and avoid them stomping on you and using the skill of switching between Banjo and Kazooie. Awesome! I want to talk about this dinosaur stomping thing because apparently in the game that set the basis for Banjo-Kazooie, which was Project Dream, they had actually utilized that function too, and I thought that was really cool, that they kept it on the back burner for four fucking years, which is a long fucking time. That's how you knew Rareware was an artist. They would have stuff on the back burner for years that they would then implement again because they knew it was a good idea. That's when you know you're good. Unfortunately, this brings us to the end of Rareware's 10-year legacy with Conker's Bad Fur Day released in 2001. They would discontinue the Nintendo 64 in 2002. Let's just do a quick recap of the 10 years at Rareware. From 1991 to 1993, you saw nothing but Battletoad spam, okay? They had butchered that series into the ground. And then after that, they had butchered Donkey Kong for the better part of six years. Once Rareware knew that their time might have been up with the classic Donkey Kong character because Nintendo clearly wanted their character back, not giving it to Rareware, that's when Rare started to develop their own games like Banjo-Kazooie, Conker's Bad Fur Day. Now 2001 is when they released Conker's Bad Fur Day, which is the end of a long 10 year legacy with Nintendo producing some of the best games we've probably ever seen literally creating a 10 year childhood for most people. Conker's Bad Fur Day was not a game I particularly grew up playing. And for obvious reasons. You have a cursing rat and a king, and the whole time it feels like you're playing a pretty solid like kids game. Which is ironic because it's an adults game, but you start it out like a kids game, and then it just gets progressively more mature. Which I think Rareware is just best at. You know, they followed the same formula for Battletoads. 
Oh, amazing to think that 2003 was when I finally got my hands on the Donkey Kong Country series, and that was the last lineage to Rare's legacy on Nintendo.